Good morning and welcome to Trinity Presbyterian Church. Whether you are a first time visitor or you've been worshiping and gathering at Trinity for decades, we're glad that you're here with us today. I invite you to, to sign the friendship form that's found in today's bulletin and let us know that you were here and again, welcome. Visitors are invited to Starting Point, a casual meet and greet online on Sunday, September 27th at 5 p.m. Contact Director of Engagement, Sarah Weichel, for more information about that. Our adult education classes continue online. Last week was our first week in this format, and we had more than 100 participants logging in and learning together. There's information about the different classes in your bulletin. All our classes are recorded and posted to Trinity's website. And I invite you to plan to take a road trip next Sunday through Trinity's parking lot between noon and 1.30. Enter at the Howell Mill entrance and along the way, children and their families will wrap up the Summer Storytime Live series by receiving a book chosen for each child. Continue on to the Porta Cochere where you can wave to our new contract call associate pastor, Reverend Lucy Strong. And finally, everyone is invited to order a to-go box from Trinity's Holy Smokers Barbecue. This is a drive through Everyone is invited and asked to remain in their cars and to keep moving through our parking lot receiving line. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday. For more information and to place your barbecue order, visit trinityatlanta.org. The flowers in the sanctuary this morning are given by Trinity School to the glory of God and in appreciation of Trinity Presbyterian Church. Let us now worship God together. Come, you who hunger for food, worship God who turns want into plenty. Come, you who hunger for justice, Worship God, who turns weeping into joy. Come, you who hunger for life. Worship God, who is our hope and consolation.
Friends, when Jesus sat at table offering bread to his disciples, he knew their weaknesses, their doubts, their premature certainties, their excesses and their deficits. Yet in love, he still blessed, broke, and gave the bread to his disciples to eat. He gave to them life-giving bread, warm as forgiveness, sweet as mercy, if mercy could be tasted. In confidence then, let us come before God with our prayer of confession. You are the bread of life, O God, and you promise that we will never hunger again. But we do hunger, and often for the wrong things. We are fed with grace, but we hunger for achievements. We are offered peace, but we hunger for control. We are blessed with enough, but we hunger for more. Forgive us, O God. Teach us to hunger for justice, to crave the common good, so that none of your people may hunger any longer. Amen. Friends, believe the good news. Jesus, the bread of life, says that we who believe in him will never be hungry again, and that anyone who comes to him, he will never turn away. So we come before Christ and find in him grace more plentiful than our needs. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God for the bread of life, giving life to the world. Let us pray. Creating God, source of all good, be a light to our path. Open our eyes to see your beauty. Open our ears to hear your word. Open our hearts to know your peace. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 16. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to us. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke, the whole congregation of the Israelites looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, 
At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is this? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Over the past several weeks, we've been following the story of the people of Israel, how they survived famine and family strife only to become slaves in Egypt, how Moses heard God calling from a burning bush, how he led the people to freedom after a series of plagues brought Egypt to its knees, how the people followed towers of cloud and fire and walked through the sea on dry ground to escape the Egyptians. It's actually a pretty good story. And here at last, the people are free. Egypt is in the rearview mirror. Finally, they can look to the future, to the good life ahead of them as a free people in a land that is flowing with milk and honey. Only one thing stands between them and this good life, the wilderness. In our reading today, reality is starting to sink in. This is when the people begin to realize you don't just turn the page on the past and find the future on the next page. There are lots of pages in between, and the word wilderness is found on every one of them. The people hadn't been in the wilderness for long, and already they were tired and hungry. These weren't hardened desert nomads. These were city folk accustomed to life in Egypt. Yes, they had been slaves in Egypt, but at least there was food, bread, and flesh pots. Flesh pots are basically the ancient equivalent of barbecue. Now the people are in this barren, dusty wilderness, blazing hot enough in the day to burn the sandals off your feet, cold enough to leave you shivering at night. The people were already starting to glance in that rearview mirror, thinking maybe Egypt wasn't so bad after all. They took their frustrations out on Moses. His inbox was full all the time. He knew he was always one step away from the people forming a PNC, a profit nominating committee, to find his replacement. If only we had died back in Egypt, the people moaned. At least we had food. You've brought us out into the wilderness to kill us with hunger. It's easy to sit back and judge the people for their lack of faith, but now that we've been wandering through our own wilderness for the past six months, maybe we can be a little more sympathetic. Because the wilderness does things to you. It strips away settled certainties. It forces you to confront uncomfortable truths. As the people of Israel wandered in the wilderness, they had to come face to face with a crucial question. What do we really need You see, time and again, the people found themselves in situations of scarcity, and time and again, God provided for them. And God always provided enough, but not more than enough. God always provided everything the people needed, but not everything they wanted. This is clear in our story for today. Every morning, God caused manna, a bread-like substance, to cover the ground, and the people were told to go and gather up as much as they needed. But if you read further into the chapter, you discover something. What happened if the people gathered more than they needed? The surplus would, poof, magically disappear. 
And what happened if they tried to save some manna for tomorrow? It would rot. The people were learning a hard but crucial lesson. Every day, God would give them their daily bread, but only bread for the day. God would provide just enough, not more than enough. We have been wandering in our own wilderness for at least six months now, and maybe longer, maybe a lot longer, depending on your perspective. You know, in March of this year, we put up a bulletin board with our theme for Lent, journeying through the wilderness. That turned out to be a little too on point. The bulletin board is still up there, and we all are still journeying. And just like the people of Israel, some of us are, are looking in the rearview mirror. When will things get back to normal, we sometimes hear? Even as we acknowledge that normal was actually pretty broken in all sorts of ways, many of us still long for the security of the familiar. Yeah, we were slaves in Egypt, but at least we got three meals a day. Of course, many of us suspect there is no going back, so we have no choice but to look forward to the future, but the future is cloudy and obscure, and we can hardly begin to make out the shape of it. So we're stuck, stuck in between, stuck in the wilderness. And the wilderness is that harrowing place where you figure out what really matters, where you learn what you really need and what you can live without. What do we really need? That question stalks this story and this pandemic that we're all going through. I saw a couple of top 10 lists, 10 things we've discovered we don't need and 10 things we've discovered we do need during the pandemic. The don't really need list includes pants, makeup, dress shoes, packed social calendars, cash, gas, in-person exercise classes, brand name products, shaking hands, and a constant stream of news. On the do need list, we have slippers, other people, alone time, the internet, toilet paper, yeast, flour, and sugar, suddenly everyone's a baker, exercise, fresh vegetables, childcare, and healthy distractions. Now your lists may vary, but I think it's a, it's a good exercise for all of us to take some time to think about what we've learned over the last six months. What do we really need? And what are we surprised to discover we can live without? This is a really crucial question for us, not just as a congregation or as a people living under a pandemic, but as a civilization, as a species. We've all seen the apocalyptic images as the West Coast burns and plumes of smoke seem to cover half the hemisphere. Last week, the National Hurricane Center was tracking eight major storms, and they're about to break out the Greek alphabet because they've run out of names for storms. The Arctic continues an unprecedented melt. This week, a massive ice sheet bigger than Paris broke off. As we all know, climate change is the thread that, that runs through all of these things. Climate change is, in some sense, the ultimate wilderness, and it raises this question with particular urgency. What do we really need? It's not an exaggeration to say that the future of the human species depends on how we answer that question. What do we really need? We could put the question differently, more theologically. Instead of what do we really need, maybe the question is, what do we really worship? Because to worship something is to see it as that which satisfies your deepest needs. 
We all worship in this way, even the most committed atheists. It's just a question of what we worship, where we look to satisfy our deepest needs. David Foster Wallace reminds us that the most compelling reason to worship something transcendent, such as God, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you look to satisfy your deepest needs, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. Worship your body and attractiveness, and you will always feel ugly and inadequate. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power you will end up feeling weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. If we worship things that can't satisfy, we will never be satisfied. There will never be enough. The point of the manna wasn't how much bread the people took, it was whether or not they put their trust in God. The people learned slowly and painfully to worship God alone, to worship the power of liberation that set them free, to worship the energy of beauty and life that brought the world into being, to worship the one that called them to create a community of love and justice. Centering their lives on that reality they discovered there was always just enough. I love this poem. It's called Joy. Who could need more proof than honey? How the bees with such skill and purpose enter flower after flower, sing their way home to create and cap the new honey just to get through the flowerless winter. And how the bear with intention and cunning raids the hive, shovels pawful after pawful into his happy mouth, bats away indignant bees, stumbles off in a stupor of satiation and stickiness. And how we humans can't resist its viscosity, its taste of clover and wind, its metaphorical power. Don't we yearn for a land of milk and honey? Don't we call our loved ones honey? All because bees just do over and over again what they were made to do. Oh, who needs more proof than honey to know that our world was meant to be and was meant to be sweet? The world is sweet. The world is good. There is manna all around us, honey and bees and bears, bread and wine, flowers and fig trees, sunlight and laughter and the summer's late bloom, grace upon grace upon grace, manna from heaven. There is enough for everyone, just enough. Grounded in the overflowing love of God, whom alone we worship. May we drink deeply from the goodness of the world. May we trust. May we share. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, it is our joyful responsibility and our glad obedience to return on a regular basis to God a portion of all that God has given to us. And so, by your generosity and by the gifts you give to this church, we are able to make God's love visible to this world. Please give as you are able this week by either mailing a check into the church or by texting to give. Don't you feel determined?
shout and go round, the 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 walls of Zion, the walls of Zion. Come, fathers and mothers, come, sisters and brothers, come, join. Please join me as we come before God with our prayers this day. Holy God, divine companion, you accompany us all our days. When the way is long and lonely, you are present in cloud and fire. When the way is dry and empty, you rain bread from heaven. You offer sustenance sufficient for the day, the hour, the need at hand, and we are your grateful people, turning to you in praise for your manifold gifts and graces among us. We turn to you in thanksgiving for all you have promised, all you fulfill, and for all the wonders still unfolding before us. God of our varied wildernesses, we pause this morning with our fears Yes, with our complaints and also with our hopes. Our fears and complaints and our hopes are all tangled together in our hearts and minds and memories. The needs we have this day make us afraid, make us forget that you are near, make the hope of recovery or help or newness seem impossible altogether. Some of us today, O oh Lord, are sick and long to feel well again. Some of us deal with chronic pain, longing to find reprieve from our discomfort. Some of us enter into this day feeling worried about someone we love, about our work, about a recent failure or an ancient regret about our ability to endure this disquiet that tiptoes next to us as we navigate the unknown way through this pandemic. Untangle our fears and our complaints, we pray, so that we may see the difference between fear and mere complaint. Separate out our hopes and set them before us as a guide. Give us endurance, Give courage, give faith unwavering in you and in one another, as together we are a community of faith. Help us all to move forward together, bound to one another, as we are bound to you in love and grace. God of our emptiness, we come before you asking you to fill us up with the things that make for life, for those who are grieving this day, bring the light and peace of your presence until the weight of death or another deep loss lessens, lightens, and our hearts breathe easier. Our dreams return with restful sleep. For those troubled by the empty rancor of national debates and debasements, and for those untroubled by the same, we pray that you will fill us with words that bless, with actions that build up others. Fill us with silence too, O oh God. 
so that we may be ever more ready to listen than to speak. For the person today who is ready to give up on someone, or perhaps even on himself or herself, we pray that you will fill them with stamina, that you will help them live, to see another day through, to resist temptation or an addiction that besets them this day. All around us, O oh God, whatever tr our troubles here may be, we know that there are people living in the choking air of flames and ash on the West Coast. There are people who are trying to recuperate from the winds and waters of chaotic storms and hurricanes along the Gulf Coast. So protect all who are in harm's way. Give comfort to those who have lost homes and belongings and to those who have lost far more the lives of beloved ones. Cover them, we pray, with your wings. Carry them to a place of safety. Lift them above the depths of despair until they may see upon your wings the vantage of another horizon. All of these things we ask in the name of Christ, the living bread among us, who has given us these words to savor. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
friends, grounded in the overflowing love of God, whom alone we worship, let us drink deeply from the goodness of the world. Let us trust and let us share. And wherever you find yourself today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace now and always. Amen. Thank you.